All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, very happy to start the second day in the morning session. We're going to have uh, Miss Young Emma from the U.S. Nation, uh, Naval Academy, who is going to tell us about interpreting finite state automata and regular languages via one-dimensional Boolean TQFTs and topological theories with defects. Thank you so um, much, Hisham, for the invitation to give a talk uh, and for organizing this conference. So what I'm going to do, <clears throat> so here, uh, what is a TQFT? So we talked about this most of the day yesterday. Uh, they play a fundamental role uh, in modern mathematics and mathematical physics. So TQFTs appear in Witten, Restekin, Turai of three-dimensional TQFT, and hegar floor homology of three manifolds and extensions to four-dimensional cobordisms. Um, Several link homology theories are four-dimensional TQFTs with restricted to links in three dimensionals and link cobordisms in R3 cross zero or the interval zero to one, like by greater Hovanov and hovanov rosensky theories. For TQFTs in dimension two, they're described by commutative for Benius algebras, where B is a commutative algebra and epsilon is a non-degenerate trace with K is a ground field. So let COB1, let this be one-dimensional cobordism. So what are the objects? Objects are zero-dimensional manifolds, and they have an, manifold has an orientation, plus or positive or negative. So for the positive orientation, we're just going to write down plus signs, and for negative orientation, let's write down minus signs. So instance, like a manifold, so it's a sequence of plus and minus signs. So what we can do is an object in this category, COP1, is of the form plus, minus, plus, plus. And then the empty sequence is the identity object, the identity object in this category. The morphism, hum from M to N, the, this is the, the hums are given by B, where the boundary of uh, B is given by M bar, disjoint union N, modular diffeomorphism, where M bar is M with opposite orientation. I'll give more explicit examples in, other, in the forthcoming slides. <clears throat> Two cobordisms are in the same category if they're diffeomorphic relative to the boundary. And the composition is given by concatenating the cobordisms along the boundary. So what you do is you have a, the for the composition, they're given by you have a cobordisms, and what you want to do is you want to stack them on top of each other. <clears throat> a TQFT of dimension one is a symmetric monoidal functor. So Z is a functor which takes a category from COB1 to complex vector spaces, complex finite dimensional vector spaces, and it preserves tensor products. So tensor product in COB1 is given by disjoint union of manifolds. And then the tensor product in the complex finite dimensional vector spaces is given by tensor product of vector spaces. So here, what you see is that uh, the functor Z applied to the disjoint union, M disjoint union with N, is isomorphic to this vector, finite dimensional vector space, tensor finite dimensional vector space, Z of N. <coughs> and the Z of the empty manifold is just the ground field, where C is a unit with, with respect to the tensor product on complex vector spaces. So what we want to do is let's denote COP1, this category of one-dimensional cobordisms. Let's, write, let's think of that as category C. Objects are zero-dimensional manifolds with positive orientation and negative orientation. And the functor is going to take a zero-dimensional manifold with a positive orientation to x, which is a finite-dimensional complex vector space. And then z, the functor is going to take the, a point with a negative orientation to y, which is a finite dimensional complex vector space. And then dot with a minus sign, it has negative orientation. <clears throat> These spaces are related by maps induced by cobordisms, A and B that's given below on the left, with isotopy relations are given in the middle and on the right. So here, the B is given by uh, just a base ground field, uh, which maps to the, this cobordism B is given by base field maps to y tensor x, and then for the other one, for the cobordism A, that's given by x tensor y, which maps to the ground field C. And then the relations are automatic just because of the way the maps are defined, the cobordisms are defined. <clears throat> uh, cobordisms A and B, they induce maps, and the isotopy relations, it, uh, isotopy relations imply that x and y are vector space dual of each other. That's 
given from the previous, what we did need to do is we actually have to follow the maps and concatenate the maps. And when we do that, we do realize that X is a dual of Y. They're duals of each other. <coughs> so, um, so given this isomorphisms, Z of A and Z of B can be written as evaluation and co-evaluation maps on these dual vector spaces. So Z of B, uh, so this map here, when we, so here's, here's the cobordism B, and when we apply the functor Z to the cobordism, it's, gonna, it's actually a map from complex numbers to Y tensor X, and the map is very explicitly given by one maps to the summation VI tensor VI. And then the other way around, A is a cap, and which has orientation, and when you apply the functor Z, it's a map from X tensor Y into the complex numbers, and this map is given by uh, the V tensor G, and it maps, it's given by the evaluation G applied to V. <clears throat> Here, the lines, the cobordisms, they can intersect with each other, but this uh, is thought to be virtual intersections. And then uh, corresponding to transpos uh, transposition maps, and then the TQFT functor is symmetric and monoidal. So the conclusion is here, one, a one-dimensional TQFT, which is a functor Z, which maps, which takes from COP1 to the finite dimensional complex vector spaces, is determined by value on a single point. So it's determined by a single finite dimensional vector space X. And isomorphic vector spaces produce isomorphic TQFTs. So our cobordisms consist of circles and arcs connecting pairs of boundary points, the outer boundary points. A circle, which is the only closed connected one-dimensional manifold, evaluates the dimension of X, dimension of the finite dimensional vector space. <clears throat> now what we're gonna do is we are gonna enhance this category C, make it bigger. So what we're gonna do is we're going to add inner boundary points and then later we are going to add this notion called defects, which is dots. Oh, so here, first of all, let's, let's uh, introduce inner boundary points. <clears throat> so what we're going to do is we are going to allow cobordisms to have components that may end in the middle with floating boundary points. And then we separate the boundary points into outer. So the outer boundary points are the ones along the dotted line. So these four points and these two points, these are outer boundary points. And then we also have inner boundary points, which are here. These are the inner boundary points. And then this component here, this is called floating component. This is also called floating component. And then interval component, which is of these, one of these forms, they may have zero uh, floating boundary points, one or two inner boundary points. So like this guy here, this has no inner boundary points. This other guy has one inner boundary point, and then this guy here, he has two inner boundary points. So here, by introducing inner boundary points, we get this category cat, oh, we currently see with IN. So, what we, so we get this category of, cobordis, of such cobordisms with inner endpoints, and then we can consider TQFT functors from this category into finite dimensional complex vector spaces. <clears throat> so half interval has, so what do I mean by half interval? It's gonna be of this form on the left, or this other form on the right. Half interval has one outer or floating, one outer and one floating endpoint. So here's an outer endpoint on the bottom, and here's a floating endpoint on the top. So depending on whether it points in or out, so here the floating endpoint is pointing in, here the floating endpoint is going, is floating out. So it defines a vector or a covector. So in this case, what we want to do is here's a floating endpoint and it's floating into the outer boundary point. So what we want to do is we want to assign to this point a vector V in X, finite dimensional vector space. And then, so, it's, so it still makes sense. This, you can thought of this when you apply the functor, functor Z to this cobordism. It's precisely the map from C into the finite dimensional vector space X. For this other guy, this is the map from X into finite dimensional vector space C. <coughs> X into C, and then for this, this is a floating endpoint, um, but it's floating in. So what we're gonna do is to this endpoint here, we are going to assign a functional F, which is a linear map, which maps from X into C. So, <clears throat> 
So a TQFT for this category assigns a vector space x to the plus n point, and then a vector v to the half interval that enters the plus n point. To a half interval which exits from a plus point, we are going to assign a covector, lowercase f. Half intervals that enter or exit minus points. Uh, so as for the minus ones, how do you obtain the inner endpoints? They're precisely given by duality. Where you, what we do is we use duality. So for this example here, this is still a functional f, which is a map, which is an element of x dual. So what you can do is, is think of this. You can bend this uh, cobordism, this arrow that's pointing downwards. Bend this a little bit. So this is really a map from 1 into vi tensor vi. And then this map here, when you, when you apply this cobordism, apply z to this cobordism. That's given by the summation. The, uh, the functional f, which applied to vi, this guy here on the left, times the basis elements, v with a superscript i. And then this, this, when you take the sum, that's precisely f, which is an element of x dual. <clears throat> and that's because this guy here, what we want to do is apply this sum to this basis elements. This are basis elements vj. And when we do that, this vi paired with vj, that's just delta ij, direct delta uh, element. And then that's times f of vi. And this guy here, the only term that survives would be f of vj. So now the floating interval it has two inner, inner endpoints. And it can be obtained as a composition of two half intervals. So the floating interval, well, you can, what we should really think of this is, is a map from c to c, complex numbers to complex numbers, the base field. And this guy is just given by f evaluated to the vector. Uh, v, which gives us a complex number. So to our TQFT, now we can, so to our TQFT, this category C with a sub, subscript IN, you're assigning two numbers. For the circles, you, are, you can assign dimension of x. And then for these intervals, floating intervals, we assign f of v, and let's call that lambda, which is an element of the ground field. <clears throat> so the only invariants that you can have are invariance of a circle, and then a floating interval. The two possible connected floating components of the diffeomorphisms. So the, for this category, the t, such TQFTs are still easy to classify for, the, for this category. So if lambda here, if this is not equal to 0, then up to isomorphism, a TQFT is unique. So what we can do is we can take v to be just E1 vector, one on the first entry and zeros everywhere else. F, which is the covector, lambda in the first entry, zeros everywhere else. When you, do, when you apply F apply to V, the only guy that survives will be lambda. If lambda is equal to zero, then there's four isomorphism classes. We can take F and V both equal to zero. V is equal to zero, F is not zero. And then the case three, you can swap these two. And the case four, both of them are not equal to zero. But then for case four, we need to take dimension of x to be bigger than or equal to 2. And then what we can do is take v to be this vector, 1 in the first entry, zeros everywhere else. f would be 1 in the second entry. So when you do the pairing, you still get lambda is equal to 0. Questions so far? <clears throat> no. OK, so now what you can do is we can enhance the category even more. We're going to, know, we're going to throw in this, uh, this ideal of notion called defects. So what we want to do is to add more parameters, we need to introduce zero-dimensional defects. We place dots, zero-dimensional defects, on the cobordism. And then you can label them by elements of some set, sigma, which contains a, b, so many set of letters. So dots can slide along cobordisms, but you cannot change the order of them. You cannot, so if you have a b on the bottom, a on the top, you cannot swap the order. And then as for the cyclic ones, the dots, defects on the circle, you cannot swap the order the cyclic order on the circle either. So what we do is now we get, after you throw in defects, we get this category C with the subscript sigma. Sigma is, so this category here, symmetric monoidal, symmetric monoidal category, will be sigma decorated, or the, the one-dimensional cobordisms have an orientation. And these are one cobordisms with inner endpoints. So a TQFT functor, Z, which maps this category into finite dimensional complex vector spaces associates a linear operator, x 
uh, A, which maps X to X, to a vertical upward line with the defect labeled A. So whenever you see a defect with the label A, we should really think of that when you apply the functor Z, you should really think of that as an operator. It's a map from X to X. It's a linear map. This guy here, um, this one's just given by, so what we're going to do is let's read against the direction of the arrow, A times B, and that's an operator. The product of operators apply, uh, which is a map from X to X. A circle with the dot is taken to be, whenever we see a circle with a dot, we should really think of that as a trace of the operator A. Now, let's combine inner boundary points and defects. So here, we've already seen this example, right? So we have an arc that's starting from the middle of the cobordism and just moves upward. So what we would want to do is to the bottom of this guy, we are assigning a vector, V. And then how do we think of this when you merge defects and inner boundary points? It's really the operator applied to the vector, lowercase v. And then for something like this, remember for this inner, this is the floating component. And then to this, this guy, this is an inner boundary point which ends inside the cobordism. So we're going to assign a function, a covector f, applied to a, b, and then the operator a, b is being applied to the vector v. And this guy here is really trace, and we're reading against the direction of the arrow, A, B. So what, this is really trace of the product of two operators. Questions? No questions so far? <clears throat> so, so in summary, we added two refinements. So we started with the COP1, the cobordism, uh, one-dimensional cobordisms this category C, and what we did is, first of all, we enhanced it by throwing in inner endpoints. So we enhanced the category, so we are getting this inclusion functors, and then we made it even bigger by throwing in defects. A TQFT for the category C sigma, is T, a TQFT for this is described by a finite dimensional vector space X together with the vector V and the cofactor F and a linear operator, or linear operators A, for each A in sigma. Classification problem for such TQFTs reduces to classifying such data on C to the N up to conjugation by GLN. And this is a wild problem. This is a problem that's, uh, that's still open as long as size of sigma is bigger than or equal to two, as long as you have two or more letters, two or more operators. Studying one-dimensional TQFTs with defects is essentially just linear algebra. We get operators for uh, the labeled dots, the defects, and then we get vectors and covectors for inner endpoints. Another possible extension that we can do, which we have not studied, would be to, you want to label the intervals, the cobordisms between dots by different colors, and then you allow multiple vector spaces, one for each color i, and the linear maps xi to xj for dots separating these this intervals. So this is a slightly modified and enhanced uh, enhanced uh, TQFT that one could study, classification of such. Uh, so now what we can do is we can also extend the base ring from C to a commutative ring R. So what we can do is you can replace C with a commutative ring R and look for TQFTs, which takes COP1 into R modules. So it's valued in the tensor category of R modules. A vector space X assigned to plus sign is replaced by finite rank projective R module V. So what we're going to do is with the plus sign with the positive orientation, the functor Z is going to apply to the plus sign, zero dimensional manifold, a uh, finite rank projective R module V. And then for the minus sign, it's just going to be mapped to V dual. And we have similar kinds of isotopy relations as we have seen before. And then as exactly as before, we can enrich this setup by adding inner endpoints and adding sigma valued defects to the cobordisms for this category, C sigma. A tensor functor is then determined by the vector, covector, and then endomorphisms A for each letter A in sigma. Here, the ring, commutative ring R, why does it need to be commutative? The reason, it, the reason for this condition is because whenever we have a decorated floating intervals and the decorated circles, you, they have to pass through each other. 
So that's why we need to work over community ring R if you want to generalize the, every, the uh, entire construction. <coughs> now, what you can also do is you can replace a community ring R with a Boolean semi-ring B. Now, what is a Boolean semi-ring? A uh, semi-ring, it has multiplication addition, but there you, don't, you might not have subtraction. So there is no subtraction in general. It turns out that when you replace C by a commutative semi-ring, uh, what we're going to do is uh, uh, write down bold face B and call that Boolean semi-ring. And then it adds a twist and different kind of complexity to the notion of the study of topological theory and TQFT. There's something interesting going on when you work over this bold face B. Um, so as you can see, this replacement relates one-dimensional TQFT with defects and inner end points to regular languages and automata, automatons, which these are topics in computer science, theoretical computer science. So what is B? Boolean semi-ring would be zero. It has two elements, zero and one. And then with the relation, one plus one is equal to one. Um, the reason why we are working with a semi-ring is because maybe this appears in real life in many instances. So an, ex so an example that uh, Mikhail and I discussed would be, if you push an elevator button, push like four, and you push four, no matter how many times you push four, you're still going to go up to the fourth floor, right? It's not going to undo that. So this is an uh, instance of a Boolean semi-ring being applied to real life situations. So that's one, is the one reason why this just seemed really interesting. Um, so now let's consider this nonlinear case. And then let's, con so let's start discussing the uh, connection of topological theory and TQFT to formal languages and finite state automata. How do, they, how do these guys appear? So finite state automata, they're, uh, basic, uh, they're basic structure in computer science. They do not have memory, and then um, they have finitely many states. <clears throat> and then whenever you have any word, a finite state automata tells you whether or not the word is in the, the word, whether to accept the word or to, re to reject the word. And then a word, the language is recognized by a language is called regular language if it's accepted by a finite state automata or if it's recognized by finite state automata. So let's look at the setup of the problem. Let's look at the setup of the computer science aspects. So it's the same thing. Sigma is going to be a finite set. We're going to call the letters in sigma alphabet. Sigma star is a free monoid on the letter sigma. An empty word is a unit element. So here are some examples. Here, let's take sigma to be a comma b. It has two letters. The words are of the form a a a or a b a b b b. So we're reading the words from left to right. I don't know. Oh, okay, this works. So you're reading words from left to right, and then this is just our convention. You don't have to do it this way if you do not prefer. Uh, and the same thing here. You're reading words. You're feeding the word into the machine. So what you're doing is you're going to feed B and then apply B again and then A three times and then apply B. These are words in sigma star. Example of a regular language would be something like this. The plus sign means A or B. So if you look at this A or B with a star and then there's a B and then A or B, which means this would be any word. So the star means you can put any number of A and B in the front. You start with any numbers of A's and B's, and then you apply B, and then you apply A, or you apply B, and then you apply B again. Basically, all the words in here, you can think of them as second from the last letters B. So this is an example of a regular language because we can cook up, we can produce finite cell automata very explicitly. Um, Star here means, again, any number of times, even none. So it could be em even, uh, you could also think of this as the empty word. We, and we go straight into reading this word B. And then A or B and then B. Here's another example. B square, A, A star plus B square with a star. So this means this, uh, this is a language of words that starts with a B. And then even number of Bs appear in each batch between the A's. So an example would be, we, so what we're going to do is we're going to read two copies of B, and then you can do any number of copies of A, because you have A times any number of copies, or you have two copies of B, and then we're applying this guy or this other guy as many times as you want. 
So here's b squared, apply a cubed, and then b to the fourth, apply one copy of a, and then b squared again, a squared, b to the sixth, apply b squared three times, and then apply a. So when you look at words like this, you see, you notice that there's even number of b's. So this is a language which accepts even number of b's between any number of a's. Here's an example, a to the n, b to the n, when n is bigger than or equal to zero. This is not regular because you have to remember n when you read a word halfway across the word. So this is not regular. Uh, Finest, yeah. <laughs> so, Quick yes. question. Uh -huh. So <clears throat> a finite state automata is, is associated to a given language. So if you have a language, you get a finite state automata that detects words in that language? I'm just uh -huh. trying to Whether to accept, if the word is in the language, then the finite state automata will tell you accept. If it's not in the language, it'll, we can draw it explicitly, and you can read off the whole language from finite state automata. But is, automata. so <clears throat> just about But definition. it has to be regular language. Yeah, but like I'm just wondering about definition here. So yeah. what comes first, the language and then the finite state automata? I mean, they come in pairs. They Are, do come in pairs. And is there always a finite state automata that detects words for a language? There, as long as the language is regular. I see, okay. Yes, yes. So yes. there are fewer, so first there's a language, and for some of those languages, there the, is a finite state automata. Exactly right. Okay. So the languages are bigger class of- Understood, right, thank right, you. Right, objects. Yes, good observation, yes. So finite state automata, here, the words in, uh, the words in sigma are inputs, and then, so what we want to do is you look at a word and then these are going to be inputs. It consists of finitely many states. The states in this example would be one, two, three, four, four different distinct states. We're going to write down the, think of the states as uppercase Q, and the transition between the states are given by this delta function. Sigma cross Q, which maps to Q. So whenever sigma is an element of the alphabet and whenever we apply sigma from one state, it's going to take us from one state to the other according to the letters read. What we want to do is we have initial starting state, Q sub in, which is given by this arrow here. This is a deterministic finite state automaton. And then we have a terminal accepting states, Q sub T, and these are the states, all the states that we accept, and it depends on the language that you start out with. So here's an example. Here's an example where you have second from the last letters B. So if you look at the word, um, Let's say, let's say this is just the empty word, and we, let's look at the word BA. What we want to do is you want to start from the state, when you start, you're standing over state X. Apply B, you're standing over state Y. Apply A, you have to move to the right. You're standing over the state Z. For the word BA, second from the last letter is B, so you accept. So we apply B and then A, you accept, so what we do is we draw two circles around that state. And then here's another state, uh, I mean, another, another word, BB. So when you apply the word, if, when you apply the letters B, you move to this state here. When you apply B again, you move up. And again, second from the last letter is B. So here, this guy here, we accept this state. Um, if you do AA, so when you apply, we, here's your, when you start, when you're about to read a word, this is our starting po point, initial state. When you apply the letter A and then apply A again, that second from the last letter is not B. You do not accept, so you do not put two circles around this state X. Yes. So um, I should mention that here, notice that the states we're writing, this is a state given by X, state by Y, a state given by Z. We're calling this state Y plus C. We could have called this W, but then you'll see later on that this is not irreducible state. These are the irreducible states on the bottom, but you'll see that in the module structure in a few slides from now. So the regular language is the one that's recognized by finite state automaton. Um, the one that you just saw here, this is called deterministic, deterministic automaton. Because whenever you have one letter A in sigma, and e for each state Q, there's at most one arrow, which is going to push Q. It's going to take you from one state to the other. So it's, there's a unique path. 
So there's at most one path, omega, for each word. For non-deterministic, finite state automaton, let's call this Q theta. It has a transition function, sigma cross Q, which maps to power set of Q. So each state Q and for each letter A, there's an associated subset, all the states where you can, you're standing over the state Q, but when you apply a letter A, it could take you to many states. You have many, many choices. And that's called non-deterministic uh, automaton. Non-deterministic uh, non finite state automaton. So uh, non-deterministic finite state automaton is better. Uh, it's more general, and you can also start you can, also, you can also have more than one initial state in non-deterministic finite state automaton, NFA. And then the word is in a language. If there exists a path in the automaton that starts in some initial states and then you end up in some uh, accepting state. Non-deterministic automaton is more efficient than the uh, deterministic finite state automaton. Uh, but then they describe the same set of languages. In NFA, you have to make an effort to decide whether or not W is in L, omega is in L. Um, and in contrast with DFA, where initial state is unique and the path is unique. Uh, or maybe the path doesn't yeah, exist. So here's an example right here. This is precisely the example of non-deterministic finite state automata. Let's say you're, you start with the initial state. You apply the letter B. So you're standing over this state. When you apply B, when you apply B, you can go around and you still end up at the state. Or when you apply B, you can move to the right. Or when you apply B, you can go in both directions. When you apply the letter B to the state Y, you end up in Y plus C. So that's allowed. So this is an example of finite state or non-deterministic NFA, non-deterministic finite state automata. And then this is also an example of non-deterministic finite state automata, where uh, for this guy, when you apply B, you can also stay, when you apply B, you can just end up in the state Y. Or when you apply B, you can go in all three directions. So when you apply B, you have X plus Y plus C. So the minimal deterministic finite state automata is unique. The minimal non-deterministic finite state automata, they are not unique in general. So here, this consists of a single, st Q in consists of a single state, but multiple initial states are allowed. So you can always start in multiple places initially for non-deterministic finite state automaton. So um, now let's interpret this automata and the regular languages with values over Boolean semi-ring uh, TQFTs in one dimensional with inner endpoints and defects. So a word can be viewed as an interval with defects. So a word can be viewed as an interval with defects labeled by letters in sigma. So here, remember, we can also think of this as a cobordism or floating, uh, floating component. So omega, you can also think of this defects, read them from left to right, or you can read from, okay, let's read from left to right. A1, A2, all the way up to AN. So we can also think of this product of these uh, product of these operators. We can think of that as a word, omega, which is in the language. So let's fix a non-deterministic finite state automaton Q tilde. We recognize a regular language, L. You want to evaluate a word, omega. This is an interval with the word omega written on it. And then a word is going to evaluate to 1 if it's in a regular language, and it's going to evaluate to 0 zero if it's not in a regular language. And then we'll remember, uh, just to keep uh, reminding you that we're working over the Boolean semi-ring, where 0, comma 1, these are the two elements together with the relation. 1 plus 1 is equal to 1. So let's take automaton Q tilde, and the last form, B, Q. This is a free Boolean semi-module with basis Q of the states. Elements of BQ are Boolean linear combinations, uh, which is finite subsets of Q. So the, the sum corresponds to the subset Q1 comma up to QM, which is contained in Q. And notice that Q is a finite set. To a letter A in sigma, we assign a map of semi-modules taking Q to the sum of the states. Um, to which there's an A arrow from Q. So when we apply the operator A to this state Q, that's just mapped to Q prime, 
where A is going to take Q to Q prime. This is the map we assign to upward-oriented vertical interval with defect labeled A. Um, so for the, returning back to our, our example where second from the last letter is B, Boolean valued matrices of A and B in the basis X, Y, and Z. So here, this is a, uh, sort of like a change of basis matrix. Here's an X. We're sending over the state X. And then when you apply the letter A, you still, you're still at state X. So there's the one there and zeros everywhere else. As for Y, if you're sending over the state Y, when you apply the letter A, it takes you to this automaton here. It takes you to the state Z. So we have zeros everywhere except for the state Z next to the, uh, next to the last row. And then if you're sending over state Z, when you apply the letter A, it's going to take you to state X. So there's a one there and zeros everywhere else. As for this guy, for the letter B, let's say you're standing over the state Y, and then when you apply the letter B, when you apply the letter B, you have, uh, you can go to state, you can stay at state Y, or you can move to state Z, or do both. So there's a one there and there's a one there and zeros everywhere else. So to a minus endpoint, we associate a dual free B module, B with Q star. There's a perfect pairing between these guys, where Q1 star paired with Q2, that's going to give you this delta between Q1 and Q2. And we also have this co-evaluation map. So the co-evaluation map corresponds to this picture, BQ tensor BQ dual. And this map here on the top, the perfect pairing, this is the map from BQ star tensor BQ, which maps to B. Uh, to this delta function. All uh, the maps are represented by COP and CAP diagrams in a Boolean TQFT. Same, exactly the same as what we have seen earlier. And the isotopy relations still hold. So the dot, now for the arrows that's pointing down, uh, to downward arrow labeled A and sigma, we associate a dual map, BQ star, which maps to BQ star given by the transpose of the matrix A. And the isotopic relations also hold. We also have, whenever you have a defect on these guys, you can also move the slide the defects around. For the half intervals, you assigned Q in, Q with the subscript in. So what is the initial state? That would be the sum of all the initial states. Summation of Q, where Q is in any of the initial states. And then the terminal guys, Q sub T star, that's just equal to summation of Q star. Q is in a uh, terminal state. The sum of initial states and sum of delta functions over accepting states. So here's a summary. Uh, an automaton Q tilde, so here's a non-deterministic finite state automaton, gives a Boolean value TQFT that to a plus point, it assigns the free B module BQ and then a floating interval with the word omega on it evaluates to 1, if and only if omega is an L. And the language is recognized by the automaton. Otherwise, it's going to evaluate to 0. So a circle with a circular word omega, which has uh, the words of the form B1, B2 up to Bm, is going to evaluate to 1, if and only if for some state Q, there's a path omega that starts and ends at Q. This can be written as a trace of omega is equal to 1. So we get the circular language, and the language L is circular if and only if omega 1, omega 2 is in L, if and only if omega 2, omega 1 is in L. Uh, so it has to be cyclic. The word must be cyclic. Cyclic works are in L. Necessarily, L sub 0 is associated to Q tilde is regular. Uh, so here's our theorem. Um, this theorem, this is by two on, with two undergraduate students and a postdoc together with Mikhail. And the theorem basically says whenever we have an, a non-deterministic automaton Q tilde on an alphabet, it defines a Boolean one-dimensional TQFT, which maps, here's the functor, which, makes, which takes C sigma to be modules with sigma defects and inner endpoints. Regular language recognized by Q tilde corresponds to floating intervals that evaluate to 1. The circular language, the trace language of Q tilde, describes words placed on circles, which also evaluates to 1. So in particular, to Q tilde, 
There, um, there is assigned a pair of languages, L and L0, with the second language is circular, which is also must be regular. Furthermore, there is a bijection between non-deterministic automata Q theta and Boolean one-dimensional TQFTs, F for C sigma, such that F plus is a free B module, the states of an automaton are elements of the unique basis of F plus. So here, the TQFTs over a field, uh, so there has been a lot of development over the past several decades, Witten, Atiyah, Donaldson, and many people in the 80s and the 90s. And then here, so TQFT has been developed over the many, many decades by many people, many important people. But then, Boolean TQFTs are novelty. This is a, our paper is the first of a kind where we looked at, we studied TQFTs over Boolean semi-ring. Um, and then what we do is we interpret this Boolean, one-dimensional Boolean TQFTs has an interpretation in computer science. Uh, the regular languages and non-deterministic finite state automata. So I should mention that nothing is known about Boolean TQFTs in dimension two and higher. So also they're worth investigating for connections to higher dimensional and cellular automata, poly category theory, and then topoi. So, so here's, um, because I do have only a few minutes left, Rather than going through this, <clears throat> what I would like to do is talk about, so this is a further discussion about how do you actually, ex how do you understand B modules, Boolean modules? How do you construct the finite state automata or non-deterministic finite state automata very explicitly? And it has connections to finite, it has a connection to as long as you have, you, you can go from topological theory to a true TQFT, as Makaya's talk from yesterday, if you're able to go f lift from t uh, topological theory to true TQFT, what you do is you also can construct an actual topological theory, topological finite, uh, finite topological theory. In the case you have a finite topological spaces, in the case that you have a TQFT. But what I'm going to do is rather than doing talking about all this, I'm going to talk about some of the work in progress. So <clears throat> it's possible that we are going to, or Mikhail will talk about number four, because that paper has been completed like, uh, last week. So that's on the archive. It's about pseudo characters and connecting pseudo characters to characters. Their connections to uh, topological theory and TQFTs. How are all these topics related? And then some of the other open problems or some of the work in progress is that we can look at even with just single letter, sigma is equal to A, what we want to do is we want to classify uh, we want to classify when do you have a true TQFT just by looking at all the languages, which languages will give you a true TQFT. Lift from topological theory to TQFT. Um, and then here, this number two, well, so in the case when you have infinitely many defects on long and interval, how do you actually study these, the topological theories and together with the TQFT? And we also um, were working on automata with boundary. And, and um, let me see. So, um, and then here's the last case, Boolean two-dimensional topological theories and then two-dimensional TQFTs, two-dimensional or higher. So what we wanna do is we wanna understand these Topological theories, rather than doing COP1, we want to look at COP2, COP3, and how do these computer science objects, automata and the languages, how do they appear in higher dimensional analogs? And that's all I will be talking about today. Thank you. Give me some. Thank you. Okay, questions for Ms. Young? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. So thanks for the talk. So um, uh, the question is, you, you use the, this Boolean semi-ring. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, can you extend the world theory to an arbitrary commutative semi-ring, or there are specific instances of the Boolean one that are used in the construction? Can you repeat the first part of your question? Yes. So ca can you do this extension of the theory to an arbitrary commutative semi-ring, or is Boolean really needed for some part of the construction? 
Uh, for the automata theory part, well, we do need the the Boolean summary. Yeah, for, for uh, automata, yes. for sure. I mean, for the TQFT with defect interpretation, can you just start with a commutative semi ring and do the whole theory, or there is some specific feature of the Boolean semi ring that comes into play? You mean in general, more generally, can we replace the Boolean semi ring to by a commutative semi ring? I have not, we have not worked in that direction yet. No. Well, yes, yes. Just to know. I have no idea of the answer. Yes, uh, I mean, I would have to think through the process where does it appear and then where does the Boolean semi ring appears, exactly those locations, and can we generalize it more by removing that and work with the commuter semi ring more generally? So. Uh, Thanks. Yes, I'm not sure yet. <laughs> yes. Other questions? So do you think there are consequences for, say, computer science? If we model things this way, would there be a consequence there for computer science? I think we're sort of looking at that we're finding more intri intricate internal structure within this automata because you have a lot of computer science. These theories have been around in computer science for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And then the fact that we're merging our per topological perspective and topological and geometric perspective and merging it with computer science, things become much more canonical and what kind of languages mm -hmm. Can you, uh, well, can you say much more about languages? The behavior of the language, can you understand the internal structures more? So I think there's a lot of internal information that's given, as well as a lot of people are studying quantum, uh, quantum computing, quantum, quantum machines, quantum computers, but then what about, can you lift? Another project that I worked on would be, if you have a classical computer, can you modify the classical computer so that it moves as fast as a quantum computer? Right, so this is what the U.S. Army is interested in, Army and a lot of people here, because to develop that actual quantum computer is a lot of trial and error. It takes a lot of man effort, human, you know, human effort. But then, I think what this will also take us is that using these, we're, on this, we're able to distinguish topological theory and then lift to the true TQFT, so like Atiyah, going from Lex to the uh, isomorphism as what we, Mikhail talked about yesterday. So. Uh, using this method, can you actually understand, can you get more, can you discover more internal structure f and for the, qu uh, for the classical computers? So that's what I think, I mean, I would be more interested in, mm -hmm. to understand the behavior of more classical computers and then mm -hmm. coming from the quantum theory, we want to sort of pull back and think, okay, what, what kind of modifications can we do for the classical computers? Okay. So I think very it's very, yeah. <laughs> it's in yeah. the initial stages of its development. Sure, sounds intriguing. Yes. Thank Great. you. Any yeah. Other questions? I, yeah. Uh, thanks, this was really, really great and Thank very you. interesting talk. Um, so uh, there's one part of the trifecta of regular language things yeah. that is missing here, which is a clean algebra, or I mean, it's there in the regular expressions. Yeah. And I was wondering um, if you found clean uh, algebras appearing um, here, or maybe if in the second dimension, because 2D um, TQFTs are certain kinds of certain kinds of commutative algebras over the complex numbers, whether you get a certain kind of well, hope you would need something non-commutative here, but something in this case. Um, the algebra is in coming from uh, the the the. Uh, well, I'm wondering if you've run into Kleene algebras, the. Uh, the algebras of uh, the regular expressions form this abstract algebra. Um, oh, uh, I have not studied in the, the, in the perspective of you want to sort of classify and understand all those algebras. So I have not looked in that direction first. I would say there would be a lot of open problems. So that is not just those five problems, but there's many other directions. <laughs> that could be, there's, there's a huge potential, yes. Do you want to use? Sorry, by clean algebra, do you mean just taking all regular languages um, under addition as? Um, it's a star algebra, in a sense, a star algebra over the Boolean semi ring, in a sense, um, in that it, it uh, but in a loose sense, it's a non, -com non commutative algebra with a star operator that's, a, that's item potent. It's the the regular expressions are the elements of the free clean algebra. But do, you identif um, do you identify them if they give the same regular language? Um, do you identify them or not? 
It's a good question. I don't actually remember. Uh, I'd have to look up the definition again. <laughs> okay, perhaps we'll have, have this it, discussion yeah. uh, afterwards, but it's interesting. Thanks, thank David. Uh, other questions? Okay, let's thank Song again for the very nice talk. Thank you. Thank you.